Have you ever planned a really nice dinner out only to get hungry mid-afternoon and have a couple of snacks? By the time you get to dinner, you're not hungry at all. Well, sometimes that happens to us spiritually. And in today's episode, Amy Seifert's gonna give us some clues on cultivating appetite for the things that truly satisfy. Well, I always love having favorite people in the living room, and it's such an honor to have Amy Seifert join us today. Welcome, welcome, my friend. You've got a new book. Yes. You come out, and we're celebrating. Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> I love being in your living room, Joanne. It's the best. <laughs> yes, I have a new book, and we're, yes, we're excited. It's it's here. It's coming. Oh. <laughs> I've only had a little time to dive into it, but oh my goodness, it's so good. Will you tell us the title? And then yes. the, I'd also like you just to dive into sort of the story that inspired it. Absolutely. Yeah. It's called Starved. And uh, the subtitle is Why We Need a Spiritual Diet Change to Move Us from Tired, Anxious, and Overwhelmed to Fulfilled, Whole, and Free, which is a wow. mouthful. <laughs> but we need that, right? <laughs> I love that you opened the book with a story that really is a powerful analogy of what we're, what's happening to us inside. Can yes. you tell us about that? Yeah. Yeah. It was about four years ago. My, I have three kiddos and my oldest son, um, we were watching him. He was eating, but he was starving and mm. there was something going on. And over the course, it was over the course about six weeks in the summer that he started to be really tired. His stomach hurt after he would eat every time. And then he was losing weight. He lost about 15 pounds in the course of six wow. weeks, which on an 11 year old boy, that's a lot of weight. Um, and I remember laying in bed one night next to my husband and I whispered it, because maybe if I didn't say it with full volume, it wasn't true. I said, do you think our son is sick? Like, is there something so wrong? And we both agreed, yes. And so after tests and blood work, we got the diagnosis back, which was Crohn's disease. And mm. I was not an expert. I, I didn't have even heard of it. Now this is our life, right? Like I know everything about it. But we decided that since it was an inflammatory disease to remove all foods that were inflammatory foods and to completely change his diet. But Joanna, I'll tell you, I remember in my kitchen taking out every spice, every pantry item, everything in my refrigerator, turning around, looking at ingredients. I mean, it's all, it was all out there. It was, it was a wreck, right? All in my kitchen. And I was a wreck. I was crying. I was overwhelmed. I had been staying up late, Googling, researching. I was exhausted. And I felt like God said to me in my kitchen, I will shepherd you through this, but you have to come to me, right? Like I, I was consuming, I was scrolling, I was searching, I was relying on my own self-sufficiency. Like I had to do all the things and he's like, come to me. You need a spiritual diet change, daughter. Mm. So. Wow. You know, and it's so true. I think of, I think of so much that we are, you know, emotionally ingesting, spiritually ingesting, not just physically, that's really inflammatory, yes. that, that is getting us worked up about the wrong things yes. or, or giving us the illusion of being full. And yet we're not. And that, that's really kind of a principle that you unpack that we can be stuffed and yet be starving. Will you talk yes. to us about that? Yes. Oh my gosh. So that idea is, um, I remember being, uh, I don't know the last time you had cotton candy, <laughs> but at our, at our, our county fair, the kids always want cotton candy and it's, it doesn't fail. They have it. And about 45 minutes later, they're hangry. They don't, they're, <laughs> they're, they were stuffed with cotton candy, but they were not satisfied. Like they were left wanting. Um, and so mm. it feels like that, that idea of like consuming. And for me, I talk about 14 different things that we are feasting on that are starving us. And for me in that moment with my son's diagnosis, I was writing to my phone. I was scrolling. I was researching. I was distracting. I was going, I just wanted relief um, yeah. because it was hard. And 
um, I felt God call me to the practice of silence and mm. sitting with him and letting him shepherd me and guide me and bring me thoughts and solutions and ideas, but slowing down, putting down my phone and picking up true connection with him. Ooh, I love that. I love that because that really is kind of the illusion that our phone gives us, isn't it? That it's yes. connection. What I, I mean, not to over emphasize this, but I think we are living in a world where it's literally in our hands. And you spend the first chapter just kind of talking about <laughs> our phone addiction. And you know, there's probably people out there, I'm not addicted to my phone. <laughs> right. Well, maybe, maybe not, but what are you addicted to? <laughs> yes. And um, and I do think though, especially in this world surrounded by so much information, it's really easy to start relying on ourselves, relying on our people. Uh, a people, you know, Googling rather than going to God. And yes. I, I would really like you to talk about that because, because I think it is, what is that thing that I'm going to other than God? What am I feasting on trying to find relief, trying to find the answers that is really leaving me empty and, and starving if I really saw myself and my con condition? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the the phone, it's so hard to like talk about the phone, right? Because we're all like, ah, because here's the thing. It's not the phone in and of itself is just a thing, right? It's a tool. And man, I have connected with people like you because of <laughs> the yes. phone and the internet and social media and all the things. And there's some really good and, and then beautiful things when it comes to our phone. It's when this um, moment of, you know, searching or distracting becomes this habit of shutting out the voice of God. I, I yeah. just, you know, I called down to my kids the other day and asked them to do something. And, and I, I got a response of silence. Like they did not. I was like, hello. And then I realized they all had headphones in. They could not hear the voice of their mother <laughs> because... <laughs> they were plugged into something else. And so what does it look like for the space making to say, I'm going to put down every other possible connection I could have so that I could connect to the King and really hear his voice. Yeah. 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 Because I, and I, I think that that's one of the challenges that we have. A lot of us feel like, well, God's not talking to me. I can't hear God. Yeah. And I do wonder if it is because, first of all, we keep thinking it's going to be naturally discerned and yes. it's spiritually discerned. But it's also like there's so many voices and there's so much distraction. I, I love that yes. you talk a lot about silence and how that's that's really hard for us. Oh. But why do we need it so much? I know. And I'll tell you, I'll be the first to say this too. And I'm terrible at it. I'm not a natural, like, give me all the quiet. Like I like, I like distraction and noise and lights and all the fun. Yes. I think that we, I think we are in need of it so badly because, um, well, a couple of things, you know, that those, the best ideas can happen in the shower, right? Like, because yeah. it's your most alone time. There's nothing mm -hmm. else. It's you and the quiet and the water. And I think there's something to saying, like, I'm going to put it down and I'm just going to make myself available. I think the availability yeah. to the presence of God, the attentiveness mm -hmm. to the presence of God. And it's a practice. I am not right. naturally good at it. And to start saying, I'm going to put my phone down for five minutes at a time and just sit and even just receive there might not even i'm not might get, get a revelation but i'm just gonna sit and practice being like that alone yeah <laughs> yeah but we're like no no amy amy spiritual disciplines means i've got to show up and i've got to engage i keep making it all about activity and productivity when he's yes. just saying scripture says be still and know that i'm god and I, it's so funny. I had the same experience, Amy. I couldn't just be still. 
I remember I was writing one of the books and struggling like I always do. And I felt like the Lord said, just let me hold you. And so we had this old couch that had these beautiful arms. And I may have told this in the podcast before, but it brings comes to my mind again, where I, I would sometimes just cuddle up and just imagine God's arms around me. And so I was like, oh, this is so nice. Thank you, Lord. But I only laid there for maybe... 30 seconds when I started saying, I need to, I just need to tell you everything that you are. And, and I just need to worship and, and praise you. And, or maybe I need to, sp- uh, you know, quote my memory verses, or, or I need to meditate on what you spoke to me this morning. And I just felt the Holy Spirit in my heart, never heard the audible voice of God, yeah. but I just felt him whisper, shh, would you just let me love you? Oh. And That's the invitation of quietness. And yet we're so threatened by quietness or we feel this obligation to fill quietness. Yes. How has it worked for you? Oh my gosh. I love that story. Like him, him quieting you down. Well, for me, yeah, productivity is so tied to my worth. Like I need to mm. accomplish something or I don't feel like I can rest until a certain portion of my to-do list is done. Like, and I have sensed God saying, I'm going, I want to heal that from you. Like I want yeah. you to be free to receive without having to do anything. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So that, that practice of, of silence, of stillness, I, I identify with this because I have wanted to have my Bible open and feeling like I want to find this gem in the quiet. But a lot of times he's like, just look out the window. (laughs) Mm, Yes. You know, just watch nature. Just what, just settle in and also not shaming myself for maybe the first three minutes of a five minute practice of silence, having my grocery list run through my brain and having all my, you know, like just the thought monkeys that I have to like put right. in the cages and say, stay there. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> but, to, and that's fine. Our brains are, aren't, we're not very practiced at silence and sitting right. in solitude. Right. And so, yeah, I feel like I've, I've slowly over time gotten a little better <laughs> at right setting and receiving. But. I love that. Well, you know, I'm, I'm listening to you and I'm realizing it really is an act of trust to yes. accept the invitation to just rest. Yes. And I, I you know, I, I was just been thinking about, we were, we we're doing a Bible study on Wednesday nights on drawing near and, mm. and what does that look like and how do we do that? And, you know, even our word for it, the spiritual disciplines, again, (laughs) the emphasis is on us, Yes. right? Rather than realizing, wait a minute, it's all about him. And Oswald Chambers was just talking about, you know, that the redemption and what Christ did on the cross wasn't to make me a saint. Mm. It was reconciling me back to relationship with God. I don't have to earn it. Yes. I just get to receive it. And I wonder if that isn't part of our starvation, that mm. we keep thinking it's about what we do rather than what scripture says, open your mouth and let me fill it. Oh, uh, absolutely. Or, or him saying in the Psalms, like, um, we are the sheep of his pasture. He, like, we are his. He made us. We have not made ourselves, right? Yeah, that yeah. we get to be fed by God. I get to be a sheep. I get to you know, just, in, I get to enjoy God. I get to enjoy him. Yes. Like that is a worthy use of our time, right? <laughs> like, Isn't it? It is. Yeah. Westminster Creed. Westminster Creed says the chief end of man, and I may get this wrong, but is to glorify him and enjoy him forever. Forever. Yeah. I mean, what an invitation. So as you kind of Learn to kind of set aside the stuff that you were stuffing yourself with. <laughs> how, how did that begin to affect your spiritual hunger? Well, it's, it's interesting because um, if anybody has tried a diet change or, you know, hey, I want to have a little more healthy things on the plate, a little less sugar. Um, at first, your body's really cr- still craving that 
sugar, you know, if you've yes. has given up sweets in the past, various things like your body is like, but then your appetite, it changes over mm. time, but it's a, it's a journey. It's not quick. It's, um, you know, it's something that the process of, of swapping mm -hmm. out <laughs> different foods. Um, so yeah, again, the idea of like, because it's a practice, that means we're not good at it. We're going to fail. <laughs> we have to build our muscles at these sorts of things. So, so watch my life for, for me to actually think when's the next time I get to sit in silence, that's gross. Mm. Because mm. before it was like, Ooh, what am I going to find if I sit there and do nothing? Mm. Like that sounds painful. <laughs> right. And now right. I look forward to it. Like mm. that sounds healing to me. I love that. I love that. So what besides silence has helped you in that journey? Yeah. Um, I, there's a couple of things, um, practicing Sabbath as well. Um, that rhythm of work and rest has been huge. Um, also the idea of swapping out, um, our shame stories for yes. being the beloved. <laughs> Cause man, oh shame goodness. will starve our soul, right? I mean, shame will yes. lock us away and keep us far from others. And um, the, the story of in Luke 15, 20 has been just a radical practice of me imagining myself using my holy imagination and picturing the father running toward me, seeing me being filled with compassion for me and having him just envelop me with his strong arms. Cause that picture, there's no, there's no room for shame in that picture. Mm -hmm. Like a mm -hmm. father who is ashamed of his son isn't running in an undignified way toward him. Like there's right. no room for that. Um, so yeah, thinking through, you know, when shame comes up, oh my gosh, how is it starving me? And what narrative, what new nourishing narrative do I need from the scriptures mm. to just replenish um, that? That is so good. Yeah. And again, it comes back to this whole idea that what Jesus did on the cross really is enough. It really to reconcile is. us back to the Father. I mean, the young man came back to, to be just a slave. Well, yeah. you know, I'll, I don't deserve to be a son, so yeah. I'll just be a slave. And I love how the Father just interrupts the whole story. Yes. And he totally restores everything that the young man had squandered. And I wonder, I, I just had a, just a heartbreaking note from a woman on YouTube who is just like, I, 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 I have so much shame over my past. Mm. I've come back to God, but all I can think about is the ways that I failed him. And, mm. and, you know, I've just been praying, Lord, would you so meet her with your grace? Because isn't it interesting that even when we return to God, that the enemy of our soul does everything he can to try to keep us separate, that the, we think we have to earn his favor in order to just partake of his love. Yes. I, I, how do we get past that, Amy? Because honestly, I really feel like it's the big stumbling block, block that shame piece and that story that we're locked into that we refuse to let the cross cancel to mm. even imagine we could have a different story. How do we bring that shame to the Lord and get set free? Yes. Um, I talk about this in my book. So like, yay for counseling and therapy and the scriptures and um, helping people, you know, show you where your shame is and what needs to happen. But that, that vulnerability piece of naming the things that cause yes. shame, like, God, this happened and I name it. And yes. I bring it to you and I ask you to pour your healing on top mm. of it. And even God, is there a person of compassion in my life that would be your hands and feet to me that I could uh -huh. also be vulnerable with? And they would wrap me in love and compassion. And I would, mm. I would feel the acceptance and the welcome through someone yeah. else, you know, um, seeking That's those it. safe people. And being those safe people. And being those safe people. Yeah. You know, I think so many times we're so, 
we're so overwhelmed with our own shame yeah. that we don't know how to react to other people's shame. But boy, when we let Jesus heal us yes. and set us free, then we're able to bring grace to those people who are so locked. And yes, I love that. I love that. You know, it's that inflammation of sin that still lingers. And, and I think, you know, I, for me, I've had to stop, stop letting the shame just cycle, cycle, cycle. Cause even as a good girl who doesn't necessarily have a dark past, oh my goodness, shame. Yeah. Shame just locks yes. me down. And it's so inflames that I that I'm it keeps God at arm's length. It, yeah. and it keep, or even makes me unable to receive and even absorb his presence and his love. Yes. What what would you say for you personally when it comes to like breaking shame? I know that person that that I'm having that loving compassion person, but was there a truth? that God used or is using, because mine's yes. still an ongoing, is yeah. using <laughs> is. to set and me will free. forever, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. And while this is actually the, the second chapter in my book, I talk about shame and I, I practice the vulnerability um, and put my story out there of sexual abuse in my past mm. um, as a young girl. And and after that happened, I just locked that story away and just was like, I'm done with that. I'm not talking about that. That didn't happen. I'm going to move on. But my shame managing techniques were perfectionism. I'm going to mm -hmm. make everything look good and make sure everybody accepts me. I'm going to, I'm going to fawn and I'm going to people please. And just all these shame management <laughs> techniques that I had going on. Um, and it was actually Psalm 18 that was a linchpin. It kind of was the key that turned everything mm. open for me. I had finally gone back to counseling because my oldest son turned the age that I was, that it happened to me. It like unlocked that trigger for me. Mm -hmm. um, and after that, happened, I was like, I need to get some professional counseling. I need somebody else to help me see these things. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know? And so sitting there with my therapist, she encouraged me to, to, to write, to journal out the event that had happened and to take it to the Lord and just spend some time just praying and asking the question. And this, when she said it, I was like, I do not want to do this. She said, have you asked God where he was? In this, I was like, wow, yeah, no, I have not. I don't. And that was just that. Yeah, that so was that, another thing that got locked away. Yes, I don't. I don't want it because I'm afraid. What? What if he's not there? Yeah. What if he wasn't there? Mm. Um, I know. So I avoided journaling that and asking God that for months after that counseling session. I just didn't. But for whatever reason. One morning, um, I had a moment to myself in my house, and I had my Bible, and I was journaling it, and I asked God, where were you? And as I was praying, and I hope for the listener, wherever your shame story is, if you ask God to intervene in it and to give you a new story, man, I'm mm. telling you, he wants to give you a new story. As I was praying, I had these images of him being so mad at the injustice and of fire and hail and him coming down to this room in this house where I was like, it was a whole new thing. And as I was picturing this, I was like, why does this feel familiar? And I was like, this is Psalm 18. I have read this mm. Psalm a million times and I turned right to it. And if you read Psalm 18, it is God saying, I have rescued you and describes this rescuing because I delight in you. That's Psalm 18, 19. And it just was a powerful, I mean, I was a mess. I was crying. Like, <laughs> it's like he rewrote what was yes. going on in that moment. Yes. Yeah. Oh. oh, you know, I, there are so many questions. You know, there are so many questions. I talk to women who are like, how can I believe that God is enough here and now yeah. when he wasn't there? Yeah. And to be willing to say, Lord, would you show me? Yes. Would you show me? Because a lot of things, you know, oh, it, you know, it, I think otherwise 
we stay locked in that story. We stay and locked I'm in. He wants to give us a redeeming, a redemption story. He does. But I was afraid to ask, and I get it if you're afraid to ask, but man, God, he's this, he's a redeemer. He wants to. He really does. Yeah. Yeah. And and I assume, because I know for me, he's come in different ways than he comes for other people, but he's yes. going to come. Yes. Oh, we need yes. this message so much, Amy, because I do really, really believe that too many of us are still locked in a story and, and we're, we're afraid to trust God yes. because we, we don't, it's, oh yeah, I don't even know what to say except, oh, you guys, be willing <laughs> to ask the question, be willing to ask the question and then stick around for the answer. You know, my girls, Mary and Martha. You know, it yes. was Martha who ran down the street to meet Jesus. It was Martha who said, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. But it was also Martha who stuck around for the answer. And she yes. said, but even now I know that my, you have that power. And mm. she gave God access to her pain when he mm. said, show me where he is. And she took him to that tomb. And then she was willing to roll away the stone. And I just think so many of us are starving mm. because we're not willing to give God access to our pain. And I'm so grateful that you shared that and then sticking around mm. to let him heal because he only, he only reveals so he can heal. And yes. oh, what a beautiful story. Tell uh. us more, tell us more. How do we how do we put away, you know, the distractions or the escapism that keeps us, you know, all those coping mechanisms that you mentioned that keeps us in this halfway life? Yeah. How do we let go of what was even our, our fear of coming to God and finding out that he might see something that's harder and something that we don't think we can do? Yeah. Yeah. And yet he has a feast for us. He doesn't want us to live in famine anymore. It's so true. He doesn't. Um, I have believed a big lie that for a long time, that listening to worship music wasn't prayer. Mm. Um, and I felt like God said, I want, like, let your soul allow worship and music to wash over it, let someone else sing mm. truth over you. Mm. And so a practice is like, I do this often, a lot, three, four times a week. I'll just say to the kids, I'll be back. If I get overwhelmed <laughs> or I just need to take a breather, I will pop my like earbuds in and I will just put in like Carrie Job, the blessing, and I will walk the same route in my neighborhood and listen and let him sing over me. Yeah. And truth that my soul needs to hear. And it is prayer. I'm communing with God. We're having a conversation. Yes. Um, but I, I was pretty locked into prayer has to look a certain way. And yeah, there's a million ways to talk to God and to, you know, change what we're consuming. Like, I want to hear mm. good nourishing music that changes the narrative for me. I love that. I love it because really, you know, I, even in the physical realm, like those empty calories only make us crave empty calories, yes, you yes, know, yes. right. Yes. And so letting God change our spiritual diet. I love that, you know, silence, Sabbath, yes. that worship. What are some other swaps that yeah. we need to do? Yes. Yeah. Meal replacements. Right. I mean, and that's what I right. even want to say for anybody listening is, this book is not to like heap on more things to do, but to look at the plate that you actually have and just say, Hey, this is not feeding me. This is yeah. malnourishing my soul. Let's take this out and, and replace it with something else. The, the replacement. Um, yeah. You know, it's been good for me to call friends and to say, Hey, I have a few minutes. I'm about to head into this meeting and I feel not brave and it's going to be hard. Would you just pray for me? Like right now, yeah. pray for me. And so even going to community for yeah. a few minutes to God together mm. is a great practice that has been, that feeds my soul. I love that. I love that.
I, I love to tell people, tell me, tell me what Jesus is saying to you. you know, I love that. I mean, even you and I have had some of those conversations <laughs> of what the Lord's saying and doing. And there's something about that give and take that, that just builds me up because I, we can get, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I, I realize that I can have such a negativity bias yes. that I only see the bad. And, yeah. and, you know, even, even just that practice of gratitude, which just, I, I don't know why, but it doesn't come naturally to me. Has yeah. that been part of that getting, getting rid of the starvation? Yes. Because, yes. because it is that lack mentality, right? There's not Absolutely. enough. I've got, I've got a yeah. hoard. I've got to get. Yes. Yeah. So that there's, yeah, I talk about the idea of really, um, leaning into like, like starving the scarcity mindset and and feasting on the abundance mindset and God's abundance that he has, yeah. he owns the cattle of a thousand hills. Like my cup overflows, not just like to the brim, yeah. but like he wants to overflow. Like he has enough energy and time. And so, yes, really practicing like gratitude for it. Just, I love the, the research is coming out. It's not even just like practice five naming five things a day to be grateful for, but it's five different and specific things from the day before that, mm. that you can practice. So not just God, thank you for my family and for, you know, whatever, but, but like, thank you for my eight year old son and his warm hugs in the morning. Thank you Aww. for it so to be very specific and to see the goodness of God right in front of us. Yeah, that heals the the grumbling that we feast on, and the um, that I don't. There's not enough for me. Um, that just that mm. scarcity mindset. Yeah, that's so good. I was just thinking, like, I, I don't know why, but I forget. I forget what God's done in the past, yes. and so like bringing that back to remembrance and going, oh wait a minute. Yes. No, 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 no. This current situation. You showed up there. I was just reading in my devotions about, you know, just the prayer of Jacob as, you know, he's going to meet his brother and it's not looking good. Yeah. And he, he reminds God of his promises. And he, and he also says, I, I'm unworthy of your great unfailing love and faithfulness. This is my issue. But these are the promises that you spoke over me. And I've just been asking the Lord to remind me of the promises oh. that he's given me because today I forget what he said yesterday. And I, and, and I freak out about the future because I forget. I, yes. How does remembering and kind of feasting on the faithfulness of God in the past help us? Oh my gosh. I mean, when we feast on the past and the way that he's provided... I mean, we're collecting evidence that says he can do yes. future beautiful things, right? I mean, that it's that's why it's so good to read read how God in the Bible did that, but also yes. in our own lives. Like, I need to remind my different friends of like, hey, two years ago, remember? Like, remember where you were? And look at yes. where you are and how God like yes. carried you through. You know, and to just marvel at the goodness in our own lives and recall the stories of all these ancient stories that really like ground us for when we have no idea, the uncertainty, the uncertainty can really yeah, yeah. sink our ship, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we need to tell each other those those stories of God's faithfulness for his, his future goodness. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, as you're saying that, I'm even thinking and, and stop wanting ca cotton candy right yeah. now. You know? <laughs> Exactly. exactly. Yeah, remember what Ken Kenny did to your stomach last time. Like it's not gonna change. <laughs> no. In fact, it just makes us want more, 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 and we're yes. never satisfied. Never. And that's kind of, you know, I've thought of that. Like, Lord, thank you for sometimes taking the long way around when it mm. comes to answering my prayers. Cause huh. cause sometimes, you know, I can get addicted to the quick fix. Yes. Oh. And and I want it now. And if he doesn't show up now, then I'm like, well, what's the use? Yes. And so. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and he has always been a God of process, right? <laughs> like yes. we, he is, yeah. The process, even the idea that he, the gardening themes, seeds mm. and water. I mean, just all the things that take a lot of time. 
yourself. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and that brings us to something that I think is important to understand. And that is the process that God uses, that we don't just all of a sudden arrive. Yes. And that, that was really disappointing. <laughs> Disappointing <laughs> for me. <laughs> yeah, aren't I fixed yet? Like, what's happening? <laughs> yes, and that, and that we're made not to be satisfied one time, mm-hmm. but to need to come back to him over and over. I, I like what one author, and I don't remember who said it or where I first heard it, but they just said, "Lord, give me an unsatisfiable satisfaction," mm. to where. We're wanting and craving and longing for more. Yes. But again, we're going to have to give up the spiritual junk food. We do. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. any last things that you would say to those of us who are like, yeah, I, I am definitely, I'm stuffed, but I'm starving. Mm. I, I have so much, but it's never enough. Yeah. I keep thinking that somewhere I'm going to find that secret you know, golden ticket that is going to make me happy. But I think maybe, maybe I'm discovering that what I really need is Jesus. What would you say to us? Well, I would say just like any, any day we wake up and we're going to be hungry. Like that's just part of life. And so we have choices. What are we going to eat? What are we going to consume? What, what, what will nourish us? What won't? And to start really simple with us, with yeah. simple changes, small, small tweaks, um, putting your phone down for the next 30 minutes, um, saying before I check social media, I'm going to read Psalm 23. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like what are the ways that I can feast on God's goodness and his character and a nourishing new narrative when, you know, before I would have just scrolled and compared and left dissatisfied and grumpy. Like, yeah. What are some small changes you could make today? I love that. Oh, this has been so rich. Amy, can you tell us where we can find you online and the different resources that you have available? Yeah. So, um, at my website, amycypher.com, I actually have over 30 hand, uh, handmade printables you can print of scripture and, um, just goodies there. And you can find me on Instagram and Facebook at Amy Seifert. Yes. And you guys, you've got to check, you've got to check it out. I love I, when I go to your Instagram page, I'm like, I'm going to get encouraged today. Yeah. I'm just oh, going to yes, get encouraged. <laughs> so so you might make Amy's just a part of your spiritual diet as well. <laughs> Come on over. I love it. Yes. <laughs> Would you pray for us as we go? Absolutely. Oh, Jesus, thank you for my friend. Thank you for this time and this space and this living room and this this moment of pausing and communing together and for sisterhood. And God, we ask for your good nourishment. You call yourself the bread of life. You Mm -hmm. came to feed our souls. You are living water. We are thirsty and we can come back over and over and you are tired of us coming back. You call us, come, come, come Mm. to me all the time. You say, come and you have rest for our souls. You have nourishment for our bodies. You have, um, you have leadership for us and we don't know where to go. God, we, we come to you and we want to practice coming to you often. And we ask that this would not be in any way a burden, but a freedom to find the nourishment in you, God. We Mm -hmm. love you. Amen.